brothers and sisters in Christ. Today is the 17th Sunday after Pentecost, and as Christians, the Lord encourages us to forgive as God forgives. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. May you have grace and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our sermon text for today is recorded in Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came up and asked Jesus, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother when he sins against me? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you as many as seventy-seven times. For this reason the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle them, a man who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. Because the man was not able to pay the debt, his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, children, and all that he owned, to repay the debt. Then the servant fell down on his knees in front of him, saying, Master, be patient with me, and I will pay you everything. The master of that servant had pity on him, released him, and forgave him the debt. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him one hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began choking him, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and begged him, saying, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and threw the man into prison until he could pay back what he owed. When his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were very distressed. They went and reported to their master everything that had taken place. Then his master called him in and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt when you begged me to. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had mercy on you? His master was angry and handed him over to the jailers until he could pay back everything he owed. This is what my heavenly Father will also do to you unless each one of you forgives his brother from the heart. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Lord, we know that we have sinned and continue to do so daily. Yet you have made it so easy for us to receive forgiveness. Please, Help us to show the same mercy and loving forgiveness to others which you have shown to us. Amen. My dear friends in Christ, we live in a world filled with sinful people. You sin. I sin. The person sitting next to you sins. There's no escaping that horrible fact for any of us. So because we are sinful people and we live and work with sinful people, we can be certain that we're going to have experiences in our lives when someone sins against us. There will be times when someone hurts us with their words or their actions. There will be times when someone stabs us in the back or insults us face to face. We'll have family members who let us down, loved ones who betray our trust or who ignore our feelings. We'll have co-workers and neighbors who say hurtful things and don't even seem to care about how it's affecting us. We might even encounter a total stranger who tries to make our life miserable just because we were in the wrong place at the wrong time. When this happens, when someone sins against us, when we have a legitimate gripe against a friend or a family member, what are we going to do about it? This is the question with which Jesus confronted his disciples in our sermon text today. And it's a question each one of us needs to think about very seriously. How should we deal with a person who has wronged us? What kind of options do we have? Well, perhaps the first options that come to mind are the ones which appeal to our sinful nature. These are not God-pleasing options but they are options which come to mind very naturally. The first thing we might want to do is to burn that person's sin into our mind and never forget it. 
That's called holding a grudge, and we're all pretty familiar with it. It means that from that day on, we aren't going to look at that person the same way we looked at them in the past. We're going to think less of them, and we're going to try to avoid them whenever possible and treat them with contempt if we should ever run into them by accident. The thought is that by treating them in this way, we will never let them forget how terribly they treated us. Perhaps another option that comes to mind is taking that grudge a step farther. That's called revenge. When someone has deeply hurt us, when they have really caused us trouble, we naturally start thinking, they aren't going to get away with this. They're going to pay for what they've done. So we'll look for the perfect moment to humiliate them or to cause them to endure the same pain they caused us to endure. The revenge might take place right away, or we might choose to wait a long time before getting back at them. We might even think that it'll feel good to get that revenge. We might think that it'll bring us satisfaction and joy to see those people suffer for what they did to us. But the real truth is that nothing could be more harmful to us and to our immortal souls than holding a grudge or seeking revenge. The Apostle Paul told the Ephesians, Get rid of every kind of bitterness, rage, anger, quarreling, and slander, along with every kind of malice. Instead, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven us. Jesus forgives without limits, and he wants us to do the same. In our text for today, Jesus showed the great harm which is caused by revenge when he told his disciples the parable of the unmerciful servant. It's a good story, a story filled with high drama and unexpected twists and turns. The story revolves around an earthly king, a man who possessed lots of wealth and power. Jesus focused on one of the servants who worked for this man, a servant who owed the king a tremendous amount of money. It seems pretty obvious that this man wasn't a slave. A slave could never have accumulated the kind of debt this man had. But rather, he was much more likely an official who had been entrusted with managing a large portion of the king's money, and who unfortunately had been secretly dipping into the king's coffers. When the king discovered that a huge sum of money couldn't be accounted for, he asked the manager to show him where his money had gone. And at that point, things didn't look very good for the manager. The king had discovered that this servant owed him 10,000 talents. In today's terms, that would be the amount a person would earn in 60 million days. At $100 a day, that would amount to $6 billion. Obviously, this was much more money than this servant could ever hope to pay back in his lifetime. So, the king decided to do exactly what we would have expected him to do. He decided that he would sell this servant and all of his family members in order to recover what he could. He'd cut his losses, which would be tremendous, but at least he'd never have to deal with that thieving servant again. But here's where some of the drama kicks in. When the servant heard the king's decision, he got down on his knees and begged for mercy from the king. He asked for patience so that he could have time to repay his debt. Now, of course, the king knew this would never happen. But here's our first unexpected turn. The king had pity on this servant. And not only did he give the servant more time to pay back his debt, he actually canceled the debt completely. He sent him away with a clean slate. This is uncommon mercy, and it is truly remarkable. This is forgiveness without limits. After experiencing the king's unbelievable mercy, this servant walked away from his meeting with the king overjoyed that his entire debt had been forgiven. But that's not the end of the story. We soon learn that this servant wasn't just a thief. He was also heartless. 
Somewhere along the line, he ran into a fellow servant, a man who owed him 100 denarii. In today's terms, that's about three months' wages. So what did that servant do with the man who owed him this very repayable debt? He graciously forgave him, right? Wrong. He grabbed him and choked him and demanded the repayment of every last cent, and if he didn't get it, he would have that man thrown into jail. Can you believe that? How could a man who had been forgiven so much refuse to forgive someone who owed him so little? It's shocking that this man could be so cold-hearted and showed such a lack of compassion for someone who was just like him. But that's not the end of the story either. When the king found out how this servant had acted, he called him back into his presence once again. And this time, there wasn't going to be any mercy. The man had abused the king's love and compassion, so the king reinstated his debt and told his servants to hand this man over to the jailers to be tortured until the debt was repaid. In other words, his punishment would never end. We look at the actions of this servant and think, what's wrong with this guy? How heartless, how greedy, how foolish. Why, why couldn't he just have shown a little bit of mercy toward his fellow servant, especially since he had been shown forgiveness without limits? That's probably what Jesus' disciples were thinking too. But there's still one more very important point which needs to be made. Jesus ended his story with these words for his disciples and for us. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Jesus brings home the harsh reality that in this story, he's talking about us. When we refuse to forgive, when we hold a grudge, or when we seek revenge. So the next time someone sins against us, and we're finding it hard to forgive them, we need to think about the debt that we owe to God. God deserves payment for every single sin we have ever committed, and God very clearly tells us that the wages of sin is death, eternal death in hell. That's what we deserve for just one sin. So try to imagine how much we owe God when we put together all of our sins, and indeed the sins of the whole world. That's the tremendous debt over which Jesus agonized in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. God's wrath over the sins of the world is the cup that Jesus drank when he suffered and died on the cross. He paid the debt we owed. And because of Jesus' payment, God the Father turns to us and he speaks words of tender mercy. Your sins are forgiven. You owe me nothing. You are free. When we stop and realize the incomprehensible love that God has shown to us in forgiving all our sins, how could we ever think about holding someone else's sins against them? How could we not forgive them? That doesn't mean we should just ignore their sins. We talked about that in last week's sermon. Jesus told this parable right after he had told his disciples, If your brother sins against you, go and show him his sin. Sounding the alarm is the first part of the debt of love we owe toward one another. But the second part of that debt is to forgive them. That's the Christian way. This world's cancel culture society is filled with outrage and anger. They're looking for any opportunity to be upset and offended so they can riot and loot and burn and destroy. They are unwilling to forgive anything because they have rejected God and his word. Don't become a part of it. Forgiving without limits 
is not only good for us because we'll be doing something that God wants us to do, but it's also good for the people we forgive. When we forgive others, it reflects Christ's love for them. That doesn't mean that the moment we forgive someone, every problem in that relationship will simply go away. But without forgiveness, we're not only hurting others, we're hurting ourselves, putting our souls in danger and cutting off important human relationships. With forgiveness, there is at least hope for a better outcome. Always remember where forgiveness begins. It begins in the same place that Jesus' parable began, with the forgiveness of the King who represents our gracious God. Remember what a blessing it is to have a Savior who has washed away all our sins. Let's seek and find his forgiveness each and every day. Let's take our sins to the cross of Jesus and leave them there. Remember that we are baptized and forgiven children of God and that he has given us forgiveness without limits. So let's do the same thing. Let's offer that forgiveness to others without limits. And may the Lord continue to bless us and to always give us forgiving spirits through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, who has justified fallen mankind through the suffering and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and has declared the same by raising him from the dead, we praise you for your grace and mercy. We could never justify ourselves in your sight. No matter how much we try, we are still sinners. Even our righteous deeds are as filthy rags, tainted by our many sins. And yet we come with boldness before you, because we trust in your Son, knowing that through him there is complete forgiveness for everyone. Dear Jesus, we know and confess that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. By humbling yourself and becoming, becoming obedient to death for our sins, you have rescued lost sinners like us from certain destruction and have provided us with a robe of righteousness cleansed in your blood. Comfort us and give us that surpassing peace which comes from knowing that we are justified and saved by you. Spirit of truth, we bless your holy name because you have awakened our hearts to receive Christ personally through faith so that you might make forgiveness and eternal life ours as individuals. Continue to fill us with your grace. Keep us steadfast and true in our trust. Enable us to bring forth the fruits of salvation, good works to the glory of our Savior. Cause all sinners to seek and to find cleansing in the blood of Jesus, that being justified from their sins, they may be saved from the wrath which is to come. Let none of us trust in our own good works for salvation. By increasing our faith, give us strength and patience to endure every affliction that is sent our way to test us, and to resist every sin with which we are tempted. Amen. We join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Lord, look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.